school's spring exercise. And uh, as you probably know, the first two panels were on science and on economics. The one thing we have discovered so far on global climate change is that it is the ultimate global commons problem. This is not a problem that can be solved unilaterally, no matter how effective or well-intentioned the unilateral action might be. It requires a truly global response. And the Kyoto Protocol is one vehicle for such responses. Uh, the protocol gives all nations the same, does not give all nations the same degree or manner of responsibility. And so even if we knew the answers to the science and the economics that we looked at in the first week, and there are many people who doubt that we will ever definitively know those answers, there would still be a set of political questions left. Basically, developing consensus for action is what politics is about. And that's our focus for this afternoon. To help us think this through, we have a distinguished panel of experts. I will briefly mention their, some of their accomplishments. Scott Barrett is professor of environmental economics and international political economy at SICE at Johns Hopkins. His PhD is in economics from the LSE. And he's the lead author of the second assessment report of the International Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. He's currently writing a book on environment and statecraft, very relevant to our topic. Jeff Sachs is well known to you right here at home. He's director of the Center for International Development at the Kennedy School and former director of the Harvard Institute for International Development and Galen Stone, professor of international trade. He's the economic advisor to many governments in Latin America, Europe, former Soviet Union, Africa. Uh, he was cited in 1994 by Time Magazine uh, as the world's best known young economist. And in 1997, the French magazine Nouvelle Observateur named uh, Jeff as one of the world's 50 most important leaders on globalization. Our third speaker will be Jeff Seabright, who is executive director of the White House Task Force on Climate Change, which coordinates the administrative administration policy. Before that, he had been director of the Office of Energy, Environment, and Technology for USAID, and where he managed energy and environment technology programs in over 20 developing countries. And before that, he'd spent eight years on Capitol Hill as legislative assistant to Senator Rockefeller and to Senator Wirth, and he holds a master's degree from LSE. Finally, uh, David Victor is the Johnson Fellow for Science and Technology at the Council on Foreign Relations in New York, where he's leading a project on ways to limit emissions of greenhouse gases through deployment of new energy technologies. Uh, previously, he directed a three-year multinational research project on implementation of international environmental treaties at IASA in Austria. His PhD is from MIT, and he has edited a book of case studies on the implementation of international environmental changes. So we have the right people, we have the right set of questions, and they're each going to limit themselves to five minutes with a two-minute right of comeback after that. Uh, and we'll get started. In other words, we're going to leave plenty of time for you to get into the act. Let me start then with Scott Barrett. Thank you very much. I want to speak to that issue that Dean Nye uh, mentioned in his introduction about climate change being a global commons problem. If the United States government wants to do something about local environmental problems here in this country, it passes legislation, and states don't have the option of joining or not. They have to participate in that endeavor. And likewise, if any uh, state chooses not to comply, the United States government can enforce the federal law against that state. In the international sphere, things are very, very different. Uh, countries can try to remedy their uh, transport environmental problems by means of an international agreement, but that agreement has to be self-enforcing. Self-enforcement means uh, mainly that countries can choose voluntarily whether they join the treaty or not. And in fact, that ultimately is the essence of what sovereignty means, having that freedom of choice. 
There's a related question about compliance. Do the countries that choose to be in actually have to do what they said they would do? And again, under the rules of international law, countries are expected to do what they said they would do. However, um, the problems of compliance and participation are linked. If you really don't want to comply with the treaty, you don't have to participate in it. That's allowed under the rules of international law. If you join the treaty and later decide you don't want to comply with it, you can withdraw from the treaty. So the real problem with international cooperation is participation and how to widen participation. And I want to look at the Kyoto Protocol and ask what mechanisms that treaty has that helps or hinders this uh, uh, <coughs> desire to try to increase participation. Well, one way to increase participation is you set the basic requirements of a treaty so low that it's so easy to meet that everyone's going to join because it doesn't cost anything to join. And unfortunately, this is one of the big approaches we take in, uh, in this area. If you look at the Kyoto Protocol, uh, we've taken that approach as regards the uh, non-Annex I countries, the poorer countries. The obligations that they have to bear are so weak that really there's nothing to lose for them in joining. For the Annex I countries, the industrialized countries, things are very different. And all the evidence I've seen suggests that the constraint of Kyoto will bite in such a way that the cost of participation will be high for these countries. Now, before uh, uh, leaving to go to the airport this morning, I got on the computer to see who's actually ratified the treaty so far. 22 countries have ratified. Not a single one of these countries is an Annex I country. 11, by the way, are small island states. Okay, trading. One of the nice things about trading, of course, is it lowers the cost of doing whatever was agreed should be done. But the other thing about trading is, in lowering the cost, it makes participation more attractive to the countries that actually have to do something. So it's important that that trading provision, <coughs> given that you've already set quantities, given that you've already set targets for the other country, for the Annex I countries, that trading be allowed to have a full reign. This leads to the issue raised by the Europeans about supplementarity. Should trading be restricted at all? On the whole, restrictions are a bad thing because they push up costs and therefore deter participation. But there's one exception to this I'll come back to in a minute. Clean development mechanism is very important because that's the only way that we can actually bring the poorer countries under the current arrangements within the treaty to actually do something to contribute toward reducing, mitigating greenhouse gas emissions. However, the way the CDM is organized, the costs of implementing this program will be, in my view, very, very substantial, primarily the transactions costs, because you can't have a normal trading regime. You have to have case-by-case -case negotiation and because of the possibilities for paper trades, I think, I think you know what I mean by that, uh, this system will be subject to huge transactions costs. So that provision won't help as much as we might like. Hot air. Hot air raises a number of issues. <clears throat> Obviously, if you provide hot air and provide incentives for countries from the former Soviet Union and Eastern Europe to join the treaty, that's good because it allows uh, more extensive trading that lowers costs for everyone and enc encourages participation. Um, it's also good from the point of view that because they were, these countries were given a huge surplus of permits, basically um, you're lowering the overall constraint on all Annex I countries by allowing these countries to come in and to trade. Okay? The downside to all of this, of course, is you've also lowered at the same time the benefits of participating in the program because less emission reductions will actually be achieved. One issue that I didn't see raised in the materials that were sent to me has to do with international trade. As one group of countries reduces their emissions, comparative advantage, in a sense, shifts in the, in the polluting industries towards the countries that are not bound by the treaty. That means that emissions may shift, and therefore, again, the benefits of the program will be lower than, than would otherwise be the case. And the question is, how will this treaty address this problem? Uh, one way to do it is to increase participation. If everyone's in the agreement, then by definition, leakage, this trade leakage problem won't, uh, won't exist. There's one mechanism in the treaty that tries to do that. That's the minimum participation clause. So this treaty only comes into force if ratified by 55 countries, and they make up 55% of the emissions of the Annex I countries. There are two problems with this one, though. One is that uh, uh, you're still leaving out all the non-Annex I countries, and that's where much of the pollution might possibly go to. There's some speculation about how big the trade leakage problem might be. And the second issue is that once you've actually achieved that minimum participation level, there is absolutely no incentive for anyone to go beyond that. Because when you join after that point, you're not affecting anyone else's behavior at all. You have to incur costs that otherwise you wouldn't have to incur, but you're not affecting anyone else's behavior. The final point 
is that Kyoto not only sets these emission targets, but it also fixes a date. Now, if you want to take advantage of all the mechanisms built within that treaty, it's going to take some time to build up institutions that will allow for trading, for example, for monitoring, compliance, and so on and so forth. But the Kyoto has a fixed date when it has to come into force. Okay? And what happens is as you squeeze the amount of time you have to bring the treaty, uh, to, to actually carry out the obligations in the treaty, you're pushing up the cost. And every time you push up the cost, you discourage participation. So in a sense, that feature of the treaty is a self-destruct mechanism. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jeff. Jeff Sachs. Thank you very much. Uh, well, there is uh, no end <coughs> to the complexity of this issue, and five minutes uh, will not even make a beginning uh, of it. Uh, I think I'm going to treat the Kyoto Agreement uh, <coughs> itself as a very interim uh, instrument, which I don't think is uh, anywhere close to the final word that we're going to have on, uh, on climate change or international agreements. It was made under a context of tremendous scientific uncertainty, tremendous economic uncertainty, uh, and the lack of participation of much of the world. And so it doesn't seem to me to add up to that much yet. That's okay. I think we have many years, actually, to get this right. Uh, and I don't think that it's desperate that we get it right by this treaty or uh, some other way. What we really need to do is understand the framework a lot better. What would a good framework be? Uh, two main considerations, I think, uh, are absolutely at the fore. Uh, one is efficiency. Uh, and that is, uh, will, a, an, will the framework that is eventually decided on produce an efficient outcome? And broadly speaking, in economic terms, that means uh, will the sources of carbon emission uh, be limited to the extent that, uh, such that the marginal benefits of uh, the emissions of uh, carbon are equated with the marginal costs? Under a decentralized market arrangement, of course, you don't have that kind of equation of marginal costs and marginal benefits because the marginal costs of carbon in terms of the long-term climate change are not part of anyone's private calculations. So an efficient outcome would, of course, drive, presumably drive down carbon emissions, but it wouldn't drive them down indiscriminately. It would drive them down to equate the benefits of using fuels or, uh, or uh, um, uh, forestry products with the marginal costs that include both the observed production costs plus the social costs involved with the climate change. The second main consideration of any agreement, of course, is equity. Uh, is it a fair agreement uh, that uh, treats the parties to the agreement in a balanced way? Now, of course, fairness is even uh, more subject uh, to uh, more in the eye of the beholder than, than efficiency. Uh, fairness according to which standards? Uh, it seems to me that Kyoto doesn't come close to either of these two goals, uh, either the efficiency goal or the equity goal. The equity goal is important uh, not just uh, from a moral standpoint, but also from the kind of standpoint that Scott Barrett was just talking about, countries will not comply, they won't even join a treaty that they regard as somehow intrinsically unfair. And the developing world, as you know, is deeply suspicious of even taking a step into this, though efficiency considerations say that absolutely they should be part of a global scheme of carbon reduction. It just has to be done in a fair way. Now, let me spend two minutes on the question of fairness, because I think from the point of view of developing countries, that's essential. And it's the point of weakness of US government policy, it seems to me, up to this point. What is fair in this context? Well, there are many standards of fairness. The most US-centric uh, view of fairness is, why don't we all reduce our emissions by the same proportion? Uh, or target an increase only up to a similar amount neglecting the obvious fact that I think uh, everybody recognizes that the U.S. is putting out such a multiple of emissions per person that the effect of such a, uh, an ostensibly uh, equitable uh, course would in fact be to hinder economic development in countries that are at a low stage of development and therefore already 
uh, or are starting with a very low level of emissions per capita. But then the next more sophisticated response says, okay, we acknowledge that. Let's set standards of fairness somehow in terms of the growth of uh, carbon relative to the growth of GNP. So we'll look at energy intensities. There are several profound problems with that view. Uh, one is that the efficiency of carbon per unit of GDP will change systematically in the course of economic development as you move from an agricultural society to an industrial society, maybe to a post-industrial society, there's no reason to believe that a standard of equal baseline of carbon per unit of GDP or some such thing would uh, in fact be uh, at all reasonable in terms of uh, fairness. But I think there's a, a deeper problem that really is utterly neglected in the discourse up until now, at least utterly neglected in the discourse that, that I uh, see taking place. And that is the fact that it's not just the output side of the carbon emissions that differs across countries, but also the damages that are the result of climate change. And there is very strong reason to believe, even though we don't know much specifically about the damages due to long-term climate change, there is pretty strong reason to believe that it is the poorer countries and mainly the tropical economies that are the ones that are going to get hammered by the long-term climate change. This is because it is in the tropics where the uh, most adverse outcomes in agricultural productivity, in disease, in amenity value, in uh, other areas are probably going to take place. And indeed, many of the estimates about damages have the embarrassing uh, result that there are no net damages for the United States, for example, and maybe even net benefits for the high latitude countries, say Canada uh, or Russia or uh, China or the northern part of the United States uh, from long-term climate change. So when you start to look, and I'll, I'll finish up in uh, 30 seconds, when you look at the damage side together with the uh, cost of control side, you start to get into a real conundrum, and that is that it is not fair by any reasonable stretch on the basis of current evidence to say limit your emissions to the rate of growth of GNP, for example. Yes, of course, you poor countries will be suffering a lot from this because you're going to bear the, uh, the costs of the climate change and we won't bear it, but that's somehow a fair outcome. I have tried in recent uh, work with uh, uh, Theo Paniotu, supported by the U.S. government, I'm happy to say, uh, by USAID, to propose a different kind of fairness standard, which says that in addition to efficiency of outcomes, there should be income transfers to compensate countries that are net losers from the climate change. When you go in that, down that road, you find out that Africa, India, and some of the other of the poorest countries in the world really deserve, from an ethical point of view, substantial net, uh, net compensation uh, in the future for the damages that would occur even under an optimal control scenario. All I can say is given U.S. politics, don't hold your breath, uh, but uh, don't expect also uh, that uh, developing countries are going to jump on to any of the standards that the U.S. government is imposing. They are right to be suspicious. Uh, they are right to be doubtful that uh, anything fair has yet been put on the table. Thank you. Jeff Seabright. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Joe, and for the invitation to be here. Uh, let me begin by echoing a point that Jeff Sachs made in, at the outset of his remarks, which is that this is a process. And I think probably the closest analogy to the Kyoto Protocol and the international climate negotiations that I can think of would be the uh, ongoing trade negotiations of GATT and WTO. I and mean, we'll, we'll be doing this uh, 50 years from now is, is a fair guess. Um, it's a very complicated, very complex set of negotiations that goes well beyond uh, anything that we have uh, attempted in the past. I think it's fair to say that the Kyoto Protocol uh, is a, uh, a very sound architecture for this uh, future work, and in many ways is a signal success story for U.S. environmental diplomacy. Uh, we achieved in 1997 agreement on a market-based approach, a multi-year approach, and an all-inclusive approach to addressing this problem in terms of the gases uh, involved. And most importantly, this effort of including an emissions trading regime, which was well known here in the United States, but virtually unknown anywhere else in the world. This was 
alien thinking to most of the delegates uh, at the Kyoto uh, Convention. And uh, we were successful in getting this least cost abatement approach based on U.S. experience into the Kyoto Protocol. And I would note that the, that the intellectual roots for much of this work actually began right here at Harvard with Project 88 that Rob Stevens was involved in for Senator John Hines and, and Tim Wirth. Um, I would also note that, that although the, the CDM proposal, which really came from the government of Brazil, had a parallel in um, the framework convention's focus on uh, activities implemented jointly, it was also a clear victory for a least cost abatement market-oriented approach. So I think that's an important scene setter to, to put in place. We uh, are now in the end game of translating that Kyoto framework agreed to in 97 into an actionable uh, protocol. And the so-called Buenos Aires plan of action that we set in motion uh, at COP5 uh, will hopefully come to a head at, uh, at COP4, rather, will come to a head at COP6 in The Hague uh, in mid-November. And the U.S. really has two key <coughs> goals for these discussions. Uh, one is to focus on the cost effectiveness of the protocol, and secondly, on developing country participation. Uh, on cost effectiveness, uh, we are very clear that unfettered access to market-based mechanisms uh, is essential, uh, that we oppose the caps that have been um, put on the table by the EU, uh, which would certainly um, serve very little environmental purpose and only serve to drive up the costs of compliance. Um, we agreed in the Kyoto Protocol jointly to a 5 percent reduction below 1990 levels uh, in the first budget period. That is the only issue on the table, not where those reductions come from. The atmosphere doesn't care. And obviously the political point, an unnecessarily expensive treaty stands little prospect of ratification. On developing countries, uh, the U.S. has been very uh, uh, clear in our discussions with our partners that we need active participation of developing countries, and that can take many forms. Uh, and this is a, a scientific necessity, not just a political nicety. Clearly, developing countries today represent about 45 percent of global emissions and will overtake developed countries uh, in the next two decades. We have seen some progress. Argentina has taken on a commitment. Uh, others are looking at various ways in which they can enhance their participation. And I would differ with, with Jeff Sachs in saying that I, you know, we are certainly not putting down a one-size-fits-all approach. There are opportunities to engage in sectoral CDM, the electric power sector, for example. Uh, we have been actively discussing indexed targets as an approach uh, that would accommodate the obvious need for economic growth. Um, I would say that there has been growing interest on the part of developing countries. Uh, in looking at these approaches and looking at the CDM as a tool for their own development. Uh, and I think we have seen some very significant process, progress on that front. Uh, the President has uh, virtually every opportunity he gets when he's speaking on this issue talks about the need to reject the notion that in order to grow the economy we have to uh, uh, pollute the environment. And this theme will be reflected, I think you'll see, in his visit to India this week. Um, some of the other issues uh, that we will be addressing in the run-up to COP6 uh, the role of sinks, which is a very important uh, part of this equation, and we in the U U.S. side certainly are supporting uh, comprehensive accounting of sinks in, in, in the uh, Kyoto Protocol. Compliance, which has been touched on, is critical. Uh, we are a very uh, le legalistic society. We will certainly have implementing uh, legislation and regulations to assure that the United States complies with its commitments. We want to make sure that a regime is in place that will not disadvantage that effort. Uh, technology transfer and capacity building are also uh, very important issues that the G77 group uh, will be focused on uh, in, in COP6. Um, in closing, I would just say that uh, the road to ratification for the Kyoto Protocol obviously depends on many factors, key among them the outcome of the negotiations that we're now embarked on and some of the issues that I've just addressed. But the political environment for ratification, obviously, uh, in the next administration will also be key. And I think we here have seen a real shift in public opinion just since Kyoto. Uh, and I, this is due in large measure to the growing scientific consensus that, that exists on the impacts of climate change and the urgency of the problem. And we've seen this reflected not just in public opinion, but also in corporate America, where increasing numbers of, of companies are uh, leaving the Global Climate Coalition, which is really the anti-Kyoto lobbying group, uh, and more and more are talking about the need for a, a, a sound and responsible approach to addressing uh, climate change, including uh, BP, Amoco, ARCO, uh, here in this forum. Uh, so uh, I would just uh, close with that, uh, with, that, with that note. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. David? Great. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks to the forum for the invitation to join you today. 
There is a lot to talk about. I am um, just going to make two points in my opening comments. The first one about Kyoto, the Kyoto architecture and the trading system. Uh, I agree that we are going to be working on this problem 50 years from now. And so the question is whether we should be using the same architecture or whether we should have a rethink before we get too far down on the Kyoto uh, track. It seems to me that the, one of the great accomplishments of Kyoto is to put front and center the idea of uh, cost effectiveness uh, and the use of markets. And that's a great accomplishment of the United States. Uh, there's a real revolution underway in domestic environmental policy towards use of markets in many circumstances. And Kyoto, I think, is some evidence that that's going on at the international level. And the U.S. Uh, ought, ought to be proud of that uh, accomplishment. But I think the Kyoto architecture is, is fundamentally flawed. And the problem is that the protocol works by setting binding emission targets. There's no way that a country acting on its own can assure that it's going to comply with a binding emission target. And that's because governments don't have control over the economy. They can adopt policies that have an impact. They don't have control over particular technologies that are put into place. They can adopt policies, but they're not certain what future quantity of emissions the, their, the, will come out of the economy. So the result is that some countries are going to have higher emissions than they would anticipate, and other countries will have lower emissions than they would anticipate. And that's exactly the situation right now. The U.S. economy, in part because of its robust economic growth, emissions are about 10 to 15 percent higher than they were in 1990 levels and are slated to grow another 10 or 15 percent. Canada is up uh, 13 percent. In Europe, the situation is very different. Emissions are approximately flat. In Japan, Emissions are rising only very slowly, largely because the uh, Japanese economy has, has, done, has done poorly. Some of these effects were anticipated and others weren't anticipated. Now, emission trading solves this problem because it allows countries that don't quite meet their targets to buy and sell credits and, 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 uh, and balance the books at the end of the day. The problem with trading is that it can't begin until the permits are allocated. And this is my point about the Kyoto architecture. And if the initial allocation is not perfect, exact, not along lines of, of equal marginal cost, then huge financial flows can result as the market equilibrates. Uh, the case of Russia and Ukraine, the extra permits for Russia and Ukraine, which uh, I presume everybody knows is uh, called with the term hot air, is a particular illustration of this, of this general problem. These countries got a windfall in Kyoto that uh, that is worth tens of billions of dollars, maybe a hundred billion dollars. And on the one hand, this I think is a treaty killer for the treaty in the United States, because I can't imagine the United States Senate ratifying a treaty that sends tens of billions of dollars to Russia and Ukraine for essentially no environmental benefit. And yet, if you disallow that, the United States can't comply. So I think either way, the United States is in the position where it's not going to be able uh, to, to ratify the Kyoto Protocol. Now, you might think that this is a special case, that if we replayed the tape of Kyoto and we knew more, that we could do a better job allocating the permits uh, uh, the next time. But I think this is a fundamental problem of emissions trading. And when the developing countries are involved in trading, it's going to make the problem uh, that much worse, because they're uh, not going to be interested in participating unless there's also some, some hot air in, in it uh, for them as well. The European Union has proposed a solution to this problem, which is to cap the use of trading, say, at 50 percent of a country's target. But that solution, as Jeff Seabright said, is a, is a, not in these words, is a crazy idea, because it guarantees that the lowest cost permits are going to be used to fill up the cap. And so that means that, that essentially all the trading is going to be hot air and the bona fide trades aren't going to happen. So it's, it's exactly in the wrong direction. I, I think. To, to conclude my point about uh, allocation, I think the only way to fix this particular problem in Kyoto is to reopen the targets. Uh, but when we reopen the targets, we're going to realize that, that cold starting an emissions trading program is just extraordinarily difficult. Uh, let me end with my second point, which is that when we negotiate the son of Kyoto, we ought to think hard about what's so special about an emissions cap. Why do we care about an emissions cap? The atmosphere actually doesn't care very much. The atmosphere, this is principally what's called a stock problem. The global warming problem is mainly due to the buildup of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, and carbon dioxide is a long-lived greenhouse gas. It doesn't matter exactly when the gas is emitted. In these kinds of problems, the more efficient uh, uh, solution is typically to adopt some kind of a tax. In this case, it would be a carbon tax. 
Uh, I think the, uh, a pure tax approach is a political non-starter in this country, and it's also uh, technically almost impossible to implement at the international level. But there is some work going on now to think about linking taxes and emission quantity limits, putting the two of them together. And I think that solves a lot of the, the, the problems of the hot air uh, transfers, and, uh, and it's better suited to the nature, of the, to the stock nature of the, of the problem that we're dealing with. Thank you, David. I must say, as, uh, as I listen to these four very good presentations, I'm glad I don't have to write a memo to Gene Sperling. One of the things that, uh, that is important when you think about international negotiations is to realize that every negotiation across the table internationally is also a negotiation behind your back domestically. Anybody who's been involved with international negotiations know that managing the negotiation behind your back is just as important as the one across the table. And uh, if you mismanage one or the other, you're not going to get any kind of an outcome. So the problem of how you reconcile these problems that have been discussed by the panel in terms of domestic politics at home with senses of fairness or negotiation across the table abroad is going to be one of the key things, I think, for you all to uh, solve in your memos to Gene Sperling. We now have time for uh, each of the panelists to have a uh, maximum of two minutes to respond to something they've heard from their fellow panelists. Um, and then we throw it open to you. Uh, Scott, anything you want to use for your two minutes? Uh, sure. Let me, uh, let me say a couple of things. First of all, uh, I certainly agree with Jeff Sachs about fairness. It's quite important, and fairness is important for efficiency in the sense that uh, unless the poorer countries perceive the agreement to be fair, they're not going to join, and that will not allow the richer countries to reduce their emissions more cost-effectively. Uh, Jeff Seabright's uh, point that the Kyoto Protocol was a success for the United States, I guess in the sense that it includes market mechanisms, it's a success, but an agreement that won't be ratified by the U.S. Senate, or at least at this point looks like it won't be, an agreement that may not win uh, enough participation by countries ever to enter into force, an agreement that never dealt with the compliance <coughs> problem, has no me mechanism for dealing with the trade leakage problem. I, I don't know if that all adds up to a great success. I think one thing that this process has done for us is to start to pay attention to the real issues that were not uh, uh, addressed very squarely in Kyoto, in my view. Um, David Victor said that we can't control quantities. I didn't quite understand that either. We have a, a law, uh, you know, the Clean Air Act amendments here in this country that sets the total quantity for sulfur dioxide emissions, and we can uh, certainly um, uh, deal with that problem uh, very uh, effectively here. Also, we have a treaty that David knows very well, the Montreal Protocol, that set quantity limits, and also, by the way, allows for trading, and that was 1987. And international trading has taken place under this uh, international agreement. So it's not that we can't control quantities, I think. On the other hand, I agree with his point that uh, going the quantity route may not have been a very good thing. In fact, one reason that Kyoto includes quantities, I believe, is because after negotiators saw the success of Montreal, they thought, well, let's just do it again for climate change. And in a sense, there was this view that there is a kind of one-size-fits-all treaty for these problems. And I think that was a mistaken view, and it's really only about now that a lot of people, anyway, are start, starting to come to see that, that was a mistaken view. Thanks. Thank you. Jeff Sachs? I'll follow along uh, the same line. Uh, I would guess that we went the uh, quota route uh, rather than the tax route because this country has a remarkable allergy to taxes. Uh, and especially in the political climate that this was taking place. But if I had to guess, I would guess that in 15 years, when we really get around to making some progress on this, we're going to do it through uh, carbon taxation. Uh, it's going to be much easier to implement, much more direct, and we're going to need the money anyway uh, that's going to come from raising this to make these compensatory payments to regions that are suffering under the long-term climate change. So I think we I think the Kyoto conference, by the way, is if we're grading it, I think it was a big success uh, in trying to reach any agreement whatsoever on one of the most complex uh, topics to face humanity uh, in recent years, uh, in recent uh, decades. Uh, it's just scientifically and economically and socially and ethically uh, enormously complicated. So we made some progress on this, but 
since the science is so, uh, so much uh, in its infancy uh, in really understanding this, uh, we do have 50 years ahead. We will get beyond uh, read my lips, no new taxes, uh, maybe even after W's second administration. Uh, but, uh, and, and we will get over our, uh, that's not a prediction. <laughs> uh, that was just a uh, worry, actually. Um, uh, uh, we will get over this fixation uh, about taxation. And we're all going to grow up in this country to realize that putting on some carbon taxes is really an effective approach to long-term economic development for the world. And that's the route we're going to end up going. The theory, by the way, of course, suggests that under uh, conditions, basically conditions of certainty, taxes or quotas are pretty much interchangeable except for transactions costs, which in my view come down pretty strongly on the side of taxes. Under condi conditions of uncertainty, it depends, as you know, uh, which curves are, have which slopes and which ones are shifting more. But I feel that the, I think the best analyses of this problem uh, to date, some by uh, Resources for the Future, Billy Pizer, uh, for example, suggests to me that going down the tax route is, uh, uh, is uh, even uh, from a kind of optimization point of view, a more effective uh, approach to this. Uh, but again, it's, it's going to be the only one that's going to work in the long term. Jeff and I C would tell Gene <coughs> Sperling that. Yeah. Jeff Sebring. Uh, well, I'm certainly not going to touch the carbon tax issue. Um, but uh, <laughs> let, me, um, let me just talk briefly about the uh, quantitative limits and the, uh, and the fairness issue. Uh, you know, one of the one of the uh, aspects of Kyoto that that uh, we haven't talked about is its relationship to uh, to the science. And although you know we talk about uh, stabilizing atmosphere levels of, of CO2 uh, at at safe levels, uh, nobody really knows exactly what that means. We are clearly on a track to get to two or maybe three times historic levels uh, over the last um, over the recent past. And the consequences of that are, are unknown at this point. Uh, but we are really rolling the dice. And at Kyoto, we agreed to a quantitative limit of 5% below 1990 levels for the Annex 1 countries. Uh, as, we, as the science gets more and more clear, I think it's going to become uh, clearer and clearer that we're going to need to link some long-term goal of atmospheric concentration to the policies and measures that we're putting in place. Uh, and, and, and that linkage right now is not very well uh, defined. Um, secondly, on, on, on fairness, I guess I have a little bit of a, uh, of a different take on, on the developing country issue, having been involved with them over the last five years and having seen some of the progress. I mean, I think what Jeff Sachs says about the uh, impacts on developing countries is very real. I and mean, they are going to be most impacted, and they are clearly uh, the least prepared to cope with the impacts of climate change. The president's in Bangladesh uh, today or yesterday. 20% uh, of Bangladesh is going to go away in this century um, by virtually all scientific consensus as the sea levels rise. Uh, and other countries, those who have already ratified the convention, uh, are also likely to disappear. So, um, you know, there is a very serious uh, issue for uh, it's developing an countries. To ratify fast, right? It's an incentive to ratify fast and to do as much as we possibly can, absolutely. Um, but I think also, I mean, developing countries understand this and are beginning to uh, factor this into their national thinking. But I think also, They've begun to get, move away from what I would call sort of the stale rhetoric of the North-South debate and the new international economic order that emerged in the 70s and still dominates the G77 thinking on this, uh, which is that, that the North and the South, the rich and the poor, are, are necessarily at odds on these issues and that if you know, we don't go first and they can't do something because for them to do something would somehow put a break on their economic opportunities. Nothing could be further from the truth. We're talking about working collaboratively to grow a cleaner uh, uh, economic path for them, and, and that's something that, that is doable today and is increasingly being seen as a big opportunity, whether it's in Brazil or India. David. Uh, just two points quickly. Just to uh, follow up on Scott Ferret's point about the question of whether we can comply with emission quantity caps, uh, I, I agree fully that with a trading system, we can comply with <coughs> emission quantity caps. The question is whether we really can imagine a politically sustainable allocation of these emission permits, which are worth an enormous amount of money. The implicit allocation in Kyoto, if you calculate the asset value, may be a, a several trillion dollars, these, these, these permits. So it, it's a big deal. There's quite a lot of money uh, uh, at, at, at stake. Um, regarding quantitative limits, I, I agree completely. I think part of the reason that we are 
following the quantity route in the Kyoto Protocol. In part, it's, it's, it's because of U.S. pressure to adopt market-based mechanisms, which I applaud 100 percent, and in particular trading, which I think is problematic. But it's also because of the lesson from the, from the Montreal Protocol. It seems to me we ought to learn the right lesson from the Montreal Protocol, which is that we were dealing with uh, a handful of synthetic gases that did not have an enormous impact on the economy, and most importantly, there was an escape clause in there for any essential use. So if there was not a technically feasible way to eliminate the gas, that particular use could be, could be exempted. And so uh, in that case, we, we dealt with the problem of not being able to meet specific emission quantity caps through extensive case-by-case uh, -case review of, of essential uses. And that, I think, is the right lesson we should learn from that experience. Okay, over to you. If this is your chance to get somebody really smart to write your paper for you. <laughs> Go ahead. Is that up on? Uh, Hello? Yep. yep. Okay. Uh, my name is Frank Mitch K. I was wondering if you could take us through, um, it's funny, we seem to see a gap, or at least with what we've been given between COP3 and where we're headed in October or November. Um, four and five, uh, the issues that are on the table now seem to be the issues that came out of Kyoto. What happened in four and five on those issues, and how do you see them being addressed in six? Who would like to have a crack? Maybe Jeff, well, Jeff you know, Seabright probably has got a. <laughs> what we had in Kyoto was, uh, was an, a, a framework agreement <coughs> on, on which a great deal of work remained to be done. And the meeting that took place in Buenos Aires at COP4 put forward a, the so-called Buenos Aires Plan of Action, which was really a two-year program of working through all of those issues relating to the compliance regime, relating to the, the role of sinks and how they will be addressed within the Kyoto Protocol on the market-based mechanisms of CDM, uh, emissions trading, and JI, and a host of related issues. Uh, and the negotiators in Kyoto really you know, were able to come to an agreement on this framework and this general approach, but the details, the operational details and, and, and sort of the, the, uh, the very specific aspects of it remain to be worked out. That's what we're moving towards at COP6, and that's what we've been working on since Kyoto. Yes. My name is Susan, and my question is, uh, with landmine treaties and now with global climate change, the U.S. has consistently showed that, at least politically, it does not care about equity issues. Um, I'd like to know that uh, in the face of U.S. intransigence, can you discuss real opportunities for other world players to take tangible steps in addressing climate change? Who would like to have crack? Okay. Scott. <laughs> My view is that there's almost no point in having a treaty on climate change without the United States. There's almost no point in having a, a treaty on climate without China. You could add a few other countries in there, but that just gives you a sense for uh, the nature of the problem, given the indifference, really, that Americans have. I don't mean the U.S. Senate. I mean Americans have about this problem. Uh, the, 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 the fact that China is not preoccupied with this particular problem, uh, unless these countries want to participate, Europe really can't do very much on its own. In fact, that's uh, one reason why we got to Kyoto. Uh, Europe realizes that the actions that it takes, Europe accounts for, I don't know, something like 12 percent of emissions today, but that share will be shrinking over time. Uh, the, this is a problem where you really do need broad participation. And my own view is that without the United States, there really isn't much point in having a treaty at all. Yeah. I, I, uh, I, th I think that's right. We uh, do need participation of everybody. But it, it is not true that the general slogan that we're all in this together is going to solve the issue. And I must say that I more and more warm up to the discussion of the new economic order of the 1960s and 70s as having been uh, essentially on the right track uh, rather, than, uh, rather than on the wrong track. Um, what do I mean by that? I mean that we really do have to face up to the fact that we are probably, if the science is right, imposing very large costs on other parts of the world. The estimates that uh, Theo Paniotu and I made, they're very, I mean, First, I can't stress enough how we don't know the damages. 
Uh, and so all of this uh, is very hypothetical and it makes it all very hard to make progress. But using some very rough estimates that Bill Nordhaus of Yale made for damages by region and using some econometric estimates of contributions to carbon by uh, fossil uh, fuels and deforestation, we came up with some of the following. We found, for instance, that on uh, Nordhaus's damage functions, Africa bore about 22% of the world's damages, but contributed 2.5% of the problem. Whereas the United States bore 0.4% of the world's damages and contributed 18% of the problem. And Bangladesh, which we now hear is going to disappear 20%, uh, also contributes nothing to this problem. And another thing that may be happening, by the way, is that these once-in-a-century disasters that are now coming every few months in the world may also be a signal from long-term climate change. So when thousands of people die in Orissa, or when thousands of people die in Central America, or when thousands of people die in these massive floods all over the world right now, this, by some uh, rather you know, reasonable uh, modeling, is related to things that we're doing right now to the rest of the world. So I tell my friends in these countries, don't ask for aid, ask for compensation. You know, if it's really true that the science is uh, showing that uh, the rich countries are making this uh, devastating effect on, uh, these, on uh, a lot of the poorest countries in the world, it's just not good enough to talk in the general terms that we all have a stake together. Surely we do. But there's also a point that uh, we are so rich compared to the rest of the world that we ought to recognize that we also have a responsibility, not just a shared stake. I believe that this is going to come, and I would give it another 15 to 20 years. I think it's not going to be possible to live in a world of such vast income and wealth inequalities uh, that have, we're reaching without some rectification. And I do believe that we're going to come back to some rational and moral discussion of these issues in the next uh, decade. Hi. Um, the, the U.S. balks at the yeah, cost. Please, please introduce yourself oh, to the panel. Kate, Kate Hampton. Hello. Um, that the U.S. balks at costs, which are in percentage terms about equivalent to what many developing countries have to pay in debt service, is one hypocrisy. Um, but there's a lesser known hypocrisy, which is that uh, the United States and other developed countries put mi billions of dollars every year into fossil fuel projects in the developing world through export credit agencies and international financial institutions. And while the share of taxpayer dollars, euro, and yen uh, going into these projects is not that large, they play a very important role in terms of leveraging pr um, private capital. So basically, taxpayers are bearing the risks of, of large, rich, multinational corporations, while at the same time the U.S. is telling these countries that they should be reducing their emissions. Don't you think that we should assist these countries in technology leapfrogging rather than being hypocrites in this way? Jeff is an ex-AID official. Yes, yeah. well, and, and uh, as the chief hypocrite here at the table, I guess I... <laughs> uh, um, I, I think that... Uh, I agree with you. I mean, I think that the role of trade and investment... I mean, Kyoto, we're talking about a regime that will hopefully come into, into force uh, sometime in, in the next several years. Uh, it is prospective. Today, you know, things are happening in the world of trade and investment that are affecting the quality of energy infrastructure and local and global environmental issues around the world. And export credit agencies are playing a key role in, in shaping that investment um, flow. One of the things that the U.S. government has done under this administration has been to uh, really focus on the environmental guidelines of the Exim Bank. Uh, which now does a carbon uh, uh, assessment for every project that they lend for. Uh, they have extra terms, beneficial terms, for clean energy projects. And we have mounted a very aggressive effort within the G8 uh, and the OECD to focus on environmental guidelines for uh, export credit agencies. Uh, our European partners have resisted this absolutely because they are not interested in, in allowing, they're very interested and very bullish on Kyoto. Uh, but when it comes to uh, impacting uh, the role of Exim, of their Exim banks in terms of trade investment, they're not interested in touching it, at least yet. David? Uh, just very briefly, I, I wouldn't be so uniformly dark about these export uh, programs. Uh, a great deal of the investment in the energy sector is going into natural gas, into natural gas infrastructures like pipelines, into power plants, and so on. Natural gas is intrinsically much cleaner than most of the coals and oils that are burned for power. And it has half the carbon dioxide per unit of energy 
uh, as does as does coal. So it seems to me that that uh, insofar as the the globalization of investment uh, is is accelerating the decarbonization of the world economy, we ought to be elated. Yes. Elizabeth Siggins, my question is not as interesting, but sort of just a more practical one for our purposes. <laughs> Given the um, unfortunate timing of COP6, and I, this is probably particularly for Mr. Seabright also, what is the administration doing in anticipation that the administration could change um, in terms of making COP6 a political reality? Well, as, as some of you may know from the 1,200 pages of information I guess you've all read, the, uh, the administration uh, tried very hard to move the date for COP6 uh, to the year 2001 in the spring so that we would not have the unfortunate juxtaposition of a U.S. presidential election and then a major international negotiation. Uh, we were unable uh, to prevail in that. It requires a consensus of the parties to the convention. That did not exist, and so we were unable to move the date. Um, we are proceeding uh, as we should by working through the issues that, that are before us, and um, obviously there will, if there are uh, important changes, then We'll address those in, in the transition phase. Yes. Hi, Katie Kling Smith. I was hoping that you could comment more extensively on the European Union's stance on not trading outside of the bubble and caps on trading and potential U.S. diplomatic responses to that European position. Who would like to take a crack at Europe? David, you want to start since uh, Well, I, I, let me just briefly as a point of introduction, I think the uh, <coughs> original European reluctance to, to allowing full-blown trading and therefore to have some kind of idea of a cap, a cap is, is sort of arbitrary, is the, f is the fear that the, that the trading system is a kind of a loophole and, and hot air, the, the term now applied to this Russia and Ukraine, and, and also several East European countries have quite a lot of hot air because they've been allowed to adjust their base years to earlier years when emissions were higher. Uh, that, that sort of reinforced, uh, reinforced the point. Uh, I'm not sure what else one could say, except that the U.S., I think, is wisely uh, uniformly opposed to it. Yeah, I would just say that, that I, I think there's a certain element of disingenuousness to the proposal. The, uh, they would give themselves, under the bubble, the ability to trade internally in an unrestricted way. Some countries, 30 percent increase, others, uh, obviously, uh, a decrease. If you were to apply the rules that they have proposed to cap emissions trading under the Kyoto Protocol, apply those rules to the bubble. 10 of the 15 EU members would be out of compliance. So, you know, if you apply the very basic rules that they've proposed that we live by uh, to, them, to them, they would have a very difficult time achieving the flexibility within the bubble. And they're not suggesting that the hot air from East Germany, which is part of their bubble, uh, or from the UK and the shift to natural gas is something that should be put on the table. So, um, you know, we are obviously resisting it very strongly and will continue to do so. Scott? Yeah, just a, a quick additional point. That whole treaty was negotiated as a package, and when the U.S. signed up yeah. to the quantity targets, the um, eight, seven percent, they did so understanding that this was a deal including hot air. And if you start uh, now renegotiating on the supplementarity side, you have to expect other things to go to move on on the other sides too. Uh, you can't sort of <laughs> negotiate something and then start to unbundle and, and work at it again, bit at a time. Yes. Well, my name is John Daggett. Uh, my understanding is that for the trading of the international trading of permits to accomplish any real reduction, uh, developing countries first have to agree to accept emissions caps. Uh, I guess one is that true, and two, how can we get them to agree? You want to start? Um, yeah, trading really does mean that you have a kind of a common good that's being, a commodity really that's being traded. And that's what the entitlements, I would call them entitlements, permits, whatever you want to call them uh, in Kyoto amount to. Developing countries don't have them, of course. Uh, and they're allowed in through the back door through this clean development mechanism. And the problem there is you don't have a market, you have these project-based trades. And they would entail much more in the way of transactions costs and so on. So you wouldn't expect there to be much trading. And in fact, uh, from an environmental perspective, there are some problems with that approach, too. If you want to bring developing countries in, and in my view, if you're going to have an effective agreement, you have to. Uh, and you want trading, given that you've decided to go down the quantity route, which may not have been a very good thing to do, as was said before. 
developing countries will have to be given emission caps. What kind of caps are they going to accept? They're only going to accept emission caps that they believe are fair, meaning that those caps are not going to constrain their economies. They recognize, everyone recognizes, that uh, the, the problem that climate change poses for us was not something to which the developing countries made a great contribution. So uh, if you want an agreement that's going to be effective, you need to bring the developing countries in. If you're going to go with quantities you need to, and, and trading, then you need to allocate quantities to uh, the developing countries, but they're going to have to be given a ceiling that really provides the incentives for them to come in. The problem is that that agreement really provides no mechanism to ensure participation or compliance. And those problems have not been addressed, and until they are addressed, uh, in my view, this approach, the quantity-based approach, is really not going to go anywhere. Jeff or Jeff? Uh, uh, well, just quickly, I mean, yes, without a cap, without a binding cap, they can't trade. Otherwise, trading wouldn't make sense. I mean, that, so that, that's the beginning. And um, I think for some developing countries that have the sophistication analytically to understand their trajectories of, of where they're heading and being able to articulate a business as usual trajectory and then going below that, they could identify a cap for themselves that would, be, that would give them some headroom to trade. And that's something that I think some countries are looking at. Um, I think it's also important to note that, uh, as Scott <coughs> mentions, I mean, CDM is project by project, but there's nothing about CDM that says that it couldn't be a particular sector or subsector. It could be the electric power sector. You could have sectoral CDM. So you move from projects to groupings of, of, of activities within a sector, uh, which begins to look a little bit like a target at a national level, but it's not the overall national economy. It's the electric power sector, if you will. So there's actually, I, I view it as a spectrum of ways in which developing countries could begin to participate in this effort that ranges from uh, straightforward policies and measures that they're undertaking in sector, energy sector reform and what have you, to project-based CDM, to sectoral types of CDM, to indexed national targets. Hello, my name is Sharmila Murthy. There, my question is very much a follow-up to John's. There seems to be a consensus among the panelists that a combination of taxes and uh, emission quantity levels or caps is the way to go in terms of reaching some kind of consensus on global climate change. Would you be willing to venture some actual figures, numbers, for example, of how how to address equity and how to address efficiency, meaning should India and China and Brazil have caps that are, say, 10 times the limit of the U.S. And also, could you please uh, describe a little bit, mo little bit more detail the kinds of compliance mechanisms that you think would be effective? Thanks. You want to start with that one, Jeff? Let me just make a, te <coughs> a technical economics point, which is that you may not be able to do both the efficiency goal and the equity goal just by the way you allocate the caps. And I'll give an example of that. You know there are theories that uh, the climate change can be net beneficial for high latitude countries because of carbon fertilization of crops and everybody wants a nice uh, winter in South Dakota, in North Dakota, uh, and uh, the fact that uh, that uh, global warming uh, may actually be beneficial on net from many different points of view for the high latitude countries. Make a thought experiment, just a simple one. Suppose that that you have uh, the tropics and you have the high latitudes, and the tropics get hard hit by this, and the benefits to the high latitude countries are exactly are positive and exactly offset the losses to the tropics. Okay? In that case, there is no global social loss in that little thought experiment. So you wouldn't want caps of any sort. But it would still be fair, in my opinion, for the high latitude countries to compensate the tropics for the hell they're giving them because one part of the world's going to be suffering under the climate change and the other part of the world's going to be benefiting and since the region that's creating the change disproportionately is the high latitude regions you could still imagine that even though you don't want to control the climate change the fair thing to do would be to compensate the losing region the point I want to make is that it's not simply how you play the shell game of the caps that may be sufficient to reach both the equity and the efficiency arguments. In this country, we are absolutely without even a discourse on compensation. You will never hear that from the US, period. You'll hear that, why don't you just let your carbon grow at the same rate, or we'll give you a little bit bigger cap, or we'll do this, or we'll do that. 
but we'll never talk about the losses because that starts to get dangerous. Then we may actually be responsible for something. And I think that this is a big problem. Until we're ready to face up to some truths, in my opinion, we cannot have a global solution to this. Because with such a complex problem, you can't do it by cheating, in a sense. Uh, and you can't do it you know, by just, OK, we got Argentina in. Now how are we going to get India in? I very much doubt that on that kind of arm twisting approach, or by the way, Argentina is not a developing economy. It is a failed developed economy. <laughs> uh, and this is an important distinction to make. So there are no developing countries that have agreed to this yet. Uh, and I don't believe that you're going to do it on the sly, especially with that middle band between the tropics, uh, Tropic of Cancer and Tropic of Capricorn. I think to get those countries in, we're going to have to tell the truth that we need to figure out what are the damages. We need to spend a lot of time on the science. And then we really need to spend a lot of money to help these places overcome what's going to be some serious devastation, probably, from what's about to occur in the next uh, half century. Uh, other I, panelists. I, I yes. just want to make, I hope the record reflects that there isn't total consensus on a carbon tax up here on the panel, because I'd, I'd get in trouble if that were the case. <laughs> All right. What about the question? I'd like another panelist to uh, address this question about whether Indian and Chinese caps would be in the range of 10 times. David, you want to? Uh, I think we, we could imagine a kind of Rawlsian experiment where we try to develop some, some rules and, and figure out how, how we would allocate all these permits. But <coughs> I, I suspect that's, that's very unlikely. It tends not to happen in international politics. It might happen if there was some kind of a catastrophe that were just around the corner and that focused everybody's minds on this. But barring that, we're going to negotiate the targets. We're not going to negotiate them very far out into the future because the further out in the future you negotiate the targets, the more that's at stake and the more difficult it is to come to agreements. So and that's, I think, one reason why our Kyoto targets are these short five-year uh, time, time horizons. But we're going to negotiate the targets with the developing countries a as well. I think right now the information that we have and the institutional capacity for, doing, for running those negotiations is just extraordinarily poor. Uh, earlier on the panel, uh, someone mentioned that we might have t uh, uh, targets that are based on uh, uh, energy efficiency or the, or the primary energy <coughs> per unit of, of economic output. Well, which economic data are we going to use? Are we going to use purchasing power parity data? Whose purchasing power parity data are we going to use? How are we going to uh, measure even uh, primary energy inputs in the economy, which is actually uh, not, a, not, a, not a trivial matter? So if there's one thing we know we've got to do right now, that is to build up this institutional capacity so that 10 or 15 years down the road, we actually have a, a, a better shared ability to, to, to negotiate these. And that's true not only for handing out emission target caps, or quantity caps, but also for figuring out how you'd make a, how you'd make a tax uh, a system operate. Yeah. I would just quickly Doug? add on, on um, I mean, I, clearly we're not looking for uh, caps that would impact economic growth negatively. The idea is that developing countries have to grow. They will grow. We're encouraging them to grow. Uh, and that they should hopefully be able to do so in a less carbon intensive way. And, and any, any kind of target would have to reflect that basic principle. And as Jeff Sachs pointed out, countries at different stages of economic development uh, go through different uh, ranges of carbon intensity. I mean, agrarian societies tend not to be very carbon intensive, et cetera. So it is complex and, 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 and difficult, but that's the approach that we're, that we're undertaking. And I think that um, short of a binding commitment to enter into a Kyoto commitment in the first budget period, uh, we can envision developing countries acknowledging that there are opportunities to decarbonize their economies and to continue their economic growth. Uh, and hopefully we'll see some of that coming out of the President's visit to, to India um, when he's um, talking about these issues on Wednesday. Just to, to make a point that India and China are very different uh, in this regard. <coughs> Again, we don't know almost anything about damages. But let me point out that what little we do know suggests that China will not have as extreme damages as India. Take a look on a map, China's uh, temperate zone uh, economy. Its, uh, its bottom line with Indochina is the Tropic of Cancer. India is essentially a tropical or subtropical economy. The damages are likely to be much higher in India than in China, whereas the carbon emissions are likely to be much higher in China than in India. So again, we're in this paradoxical situation where China might not care very much about the outcomes, but 
it has a big stake in economic growth and carbon emission, whereas India, which is going to contribute a lot less to the global problem, may be very hard hit by these uh, factors, and therefore the negotiating positions of China and India could very well turn out to be significantly different in the future. China would owe the rest of the world something, India would be owed something according to the compensation uh, scheme that I proposed earlier. Scott? Uh, a comment about the equity. It's obviously very important, and the world obviously wouldn't satisfy uh, most of our views of what would make for an equitable uh, society. But I think it's wrong to throw all of these equity problems onto climate. Climate is one problem, and if you try to attach too much of your concerns about general uh, equity onto climate, you'll only scuttle a climate policy, which won't be good, as, as Jeff has repeatedly uh, pointed out, will not be good for poorer countries. Uh, if you give more entitlements to China than is required to bring Chinese into the agreement, you're actually just making participation by the countries that are going to have to make the transfers worse off. That's not going to be in China's interest, let alone uh, the interests of Micronesia. Uh, so that kind of approach, really, you need to think about equity in this negotiation, very horizontal system, decentralized system kind of context, and not the sort of top-down approach that many of us grew up with. Um, you know, the, the prototype to have in your mind, the example to have in your mind, we, we talk about a lot of these issues, might be the Montreal Protocol, which dealt with another global commons problem, ozone depletion. Uh, you're maybe too young to remember, but years ago, People were frightened that all the Chinese would have refrigerators, and what would that, what would that mean? It would probably improve the health of the Chinese, by the way, but what would it mean for, for the ozone layer? And this problem was pretty uh, easily dealt with by this particular treaty, by the offer of side payments, transfers. Now, those side payments were uh, uh, stated to be incremental costs. So in other words, the poorer countries like China, like India, were compensated to join the treaty such that they'd be no worse off in the treaty than they would be outside the treaty. So there's no surplus going to these countries at all. And one advantage of this scheme is it increases the incentive for all the richer countries actually to put the money up. And this agreement, by the way, has been fair because you've had these compensations which, by definition, have not made these countries worse off. And at the same time, all of this has been backed up by sticks, as well as the carrots, sticks which made participation full in that agreement. Good evening, my name is uh, Jose Campanella. I'm a second year student here at the Kennedy School. I'm, I'm from Venezuela. And uh, as you know, Venezuela suffered recently maybe one of the worst uh, catastrophes of uh, the, recent he the recent century, um, one, ten, $10 billion in, 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 in damages and more than 50,000 lives. And maybe the same scenario that is going on right now in Mozambique. And it, it, gives, it gives me back to the idea of the transfers and the cost for the developing world. Um, Professor uh, Sachs, you were, you were putting in the center of, of the discussion the idea of the, the need of fairness in, in the standards for measuring this kind of damages. And it looks like there is one kind of damages, the damages that come from the, this kind of actions from the, develop, the developed world that are causing this kind of problems in developing countries. But I'm thinking that maybe there is, and it seems like there is another kind of damage and it's a damage that comes from the kind of inhibition in certain, ty in certain types of uh, developing activities that is being imposed in developing countries. As we know, there is a kind of econometric evidence that if you want to increase your GNP, there is ineffable the, the consequence of increase in the level of, of uh, environmental damages that you are causing. And this is an evidence that is, is very clear in econo econometric analysis. My question is, there is room for this other kind of perception of damages that has been, been caused to Brazil, to Venezuela, to Colombia, to many other countries in Africa where this kind of dirty developing types of activities is banded, is forbidden, and uh, with the kind of transfers, and there is any kind of room for transfers for the developing world in this particular kind of damages that maybe is, it has not been addressed in the proper way or sufficiently. I think the first thing is the issue of why we're getting uh, such devastation is an open scientific question uh, as well as an economic and social question. 
uh, it may be the case that we're seeing a signal of long-term climate change in the greater, uh, the greater variability of climate, uh, the more extreme uh, El Nino, La Nina cycles, and so forth. That may be the case. Uh, it's also hypothesized from that that there may be more cyclonic activity in, uh, in the Caribbean, for example, and so forth. The science is not good enough to really establish those facts right now. Uh, this is a big problem in analysis. What's also clearly true is that these countries that have been damaged so much are damaged also because of their own internal development patterns or lack of development. It's people living in the most fragile hillsides uh, that uh, get swept away uh, in these tragedies. So for example, deforestation of watershed areas that lead to greater flooding uh, in the downstream catchment areas and so forth. Now, I don't think it's right to say in general that uh, such those latter phenomena are really imposed on the countries by and large. Uh, I don't think it's fair or correct to say that Venezuela's development problems are primarily what's been imposed on Venezuela, uh, nor the tragedy of where people were living on the hillsides of Caracas was imposed from the outside. It's a very complex and very tragic phenomenon, but not one that I think is the same category as saying that the uh, forcing event may have been the carbon emitted by the rich countries leading to more uh, extreme uh, weather uh, patterns. Where does this uh, lead me? Uh, se several uh, quick points. First, I think one of the things that we really should do as a government, I know we're starting, but I'd like to see a tremendous amount more activity in it, is in the science of assessment, the science of climate change on regional scale and its links to social development. Most countries don't have a clue as to what this really means for them. They don't have a clue what we're talking about. You know, no one has done these kind of assessments. There are several books about the possible effects of climate change on the U.S., but almost nothing on the rest of the world, and yet we're saying join this treaty now. So we need a lot of science to understand this and a lot of analysis which hasn't been done. That's one point. Second, it opens up a whole discussion about development issues which are internal to countries. A lot of these tragedies are preventable with some foresight. Uh, when you look at uh, Hurricane Mitch and the fact that there were essentially no lives lost or almost no lives lost in Costa Rica and thousands of lives lost in Honduras, and when you look in more detail at this, this was not simply that the hurricane was over one area and not another, but it was social cohesion, preparedness, uh, treatment of poverty in the earlier, uh, in the preceding period, and so forth. There's a lot to think about there. My name is Flora Stern, and my question was about these compensation mechanisms. Can you foresee a realistic method of making the compensation payments? It's your proposal. <laughs> Re realism is a, another thing in the eye of the beholder, uh, like fairness. I will predict, you know, again, that uh, in, uh, I'll be say, more prudent this time, in 20 years we're going to have a global carbon tax, is my guess. Uh, and that's going to raise a lot of money, and poor countries are going to receive a lot of the revenues. Uh, and while it may or may not be linked directly to uh, carbon, I think we're going to have to come to a world uh, in which Scott may be absolutely right. We don't want to lump everything onto climate, but we do want to make larger scale transfers to poor countries. We do need an international governance structure that we don't have right now, and I believe we need international revenues that we don't have right now as part of that governance structure. So it seems to me that we're not going to get by with donor strategies in 20 or 30 or 50 years. We're going to need global revenues for global governance. And where are the global revenues going to come from? They're going to come from carbon taxation, would be my best guess on that. David? Um, I can't imagine that that's true. And <laughs> we'll meet uh, back in 20 well, years. We'll meet, we'll meet in 20 years. But let's just roll the <laughs> clock back 20 years. That's 1980. And so we were dealing with some international problems in 1980. Uh, some ideas were being fancied around. Could we imagine that in 20 years' time that, that something like this would happen? In my view, the, the carbon tax, or actually it's a combination of a, setting uh, limits on quantities of, of emissions and on the prices, so the two work together, and, and we can talk about that in more detail, 
uh, that that approach would be harmonized at diff in different countries, but that the revenues wouldn't flow at the international level. I just, I just can't see that uh, being approved here in the United States, and I would imagine not even, uh, not even in the European countries. If uh, we want to help the developing world uh, deal with the effects of climate change, it would seem to me that making investments in adaptation and fundamentally in economic development and sound policies lead to economic development are, are the way uh, to, to cause the most, the most good and maybe less uh, on, on avoiding emissions of, of, of climate change and, and certainly not just in direct transfers that would, that would go to developing countries as a kind of compensation for harm that it's very difficult to distinguish the signal from the noise. It's, uh, I, I don't think that's going to happen. Two, two quick additional points. One is, uh, you know, the uh, OPEC countries also are asking for compensation because they're going to lose revenues, and, and that's also going to be very popular on Capitol Hill. Uh, uh, and uh, the other is that I think, you know, it, it's uh, we can think about what it would look like 20 years from now, but the reality today, just politically, is that the funds that Congress makes available for international development activities uh, for the United States government puts us dead last among OECD countries in terms of GDP per capita spent on development assistance. And so we have a huge uphill struggle across the board in terms of international engagement, not just on climate change, but on all other aspects. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> my name is Tadashi Akimoto. From, uh, this, uh, I'm from Kennedy School. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, before, I came from um, Japan Federation of Economic Organizations. That's Keidanren. And I was involved in um, <clears throat> uh, negotiation in, uh, I mean, uh, setting target in Japan. And I've been participating in UN conferences, COP3 and 4 and uh, AGBMs. So I was there in Kyoto. And uh, of course, you know that how the negotiation works and uh, uh, every country opposing to every con each word, China is opposing to the each word of uh, what the United States says. And basically, uh, it's, it's difficult to start up the, even the conference to just uh, agreeing, agreeing uh, agenda takes five, six hours, and then just nothing is done. That's uh, the reality. And uh, my, I just want to share a little bit of uh, Japanese perspective. Uh, <clears throat> so my perspective is like, <clears throat> we, it's, um, there, there was uncertainty, and there was these kind of issues, even before Kyoto, and uh, since the very mandate, and the people were trying to reach the agreement. And uh, there was so much negotiations, and we know that that is not good uh, protocol, but finally reached the agreement. That was the minimum agreement that uh, every country could reach, including a developing country. <coughs> so uh, that is, uh, 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 it's, this is already decided. So Japanese, uh, not only a government, but also a <coughs> business, is kind of, uh, this is kind of a fact. And we are starting forward. What are we gonna do after Kyoto Protocol? That's the position we are doing. And Japan made two laws about the, um, climate change. We made a one uh, global climate change law, and we uh, made another amendment to the energy conservation law. And uh, you know that Germany and England and Denmark or Norway, they made uh, basically similar uh, <coughs> energy uh, tax or kind of uh, em emission trading. So I think uh, uh, OECD countries or developed countries has already started this event. And based on, as a t fact, taking Kyoto Protocol as a fact, but uh, we worry that uh, without, as everybody says, US, it's kind of meaningless. So uh, basically, my, I think uh, the atmosphere in the, the other countries are uh, waiting United States to do uh, action, or at least just ratify this Kyoto Protocol. And uh, <clears throat> so uh, my question is, uh, uh, if possible, I'd like to ask each one of you uh, to t just a brief statement or brief position of uh, ratification of Kyoto Protocol, what you th personally think about this. All right, Scott, we'll start with you. You mean who, what, whether the U.S. will ratify? What's, what's yes. the question? What, 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 uh, what is your, your position? U.S. should ratify Kyoto Protocol or not? Should US? ratify. Right. Question, should the U.S. ratify Kyoto Protocol? Yes, your personal opinion. God. Well, sorry for not giving a straight yes or no. I think Kyoto's got problems. Now, you have two views. One is that you ratify and you work within the system to try to improve it. And the other is you just say, let's just, let's just back off a little bit and ask what's the best possible agreement we can negotiate from scratch. 
Yeah. I guess I lean more towards the latter, but I'd be willing to go with the former. I don't really have a strong view about it. But I do think that agreement has a number of flaws in it. And it's really only since it was negotiated that, and people have tried to think about implementing it and passing ratification that they started to talk about the more substantive uh, problems with the Kyoto. Jeff, yes or no? Uh, yes, to ratify <laughs> it, uh, we should. But will we? I doubt it. Jeff Seabright, yes uh, or no? Yes, if we get a good deal of COP6 that has all the things in it that we need. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Which you'll negotiate. <laughs> Which I will negotiate. <laughs> David. Uh, time has run out, and I, uh, there, there's no way that the U.S. could comply without buying a bunch of hot air, which I think is a waste of money. So the U.S. shouldn't, and I think there's only a 1 in 10 or 1 in 15 chance that the U.S. actually will. It doesn't matter who gets elected in November. Let me, uh, uh, we have, I'd like to ask the final question with apologies to the panel, because we only have a minute left. Here's Gene Sperling having to make this decision in a lame duck situation. What should he do? What should be his calculus? Uh, should he think about changing American opinion? Would creating a crisis of sorts lead to more change in American opinion? Should he be responsible and technocratic and do the best thing with the knowledge that he has? Uh, people here are going to brief him. Uh, what are the chances of changing an Ameri American opinion? How will it change over the next few years? And is there anything that, as somebody placed as Sperling is in this scenario in December of this year, can do about it? Is that something, should he think about changing American opinion, or should he take it as a given? Uh, what would be your quick answers to that? Scott? Franklin Roosevelt wanted to bring the United States into the Second World War a lot earlier than we did, and then the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, and that expedited things a bit. Uh, it's very hard to leave, particularly on an issue like this, which would be so pervasive in the way that Kyoto is constructed, potentially very costly for the United States. Um, I think it's very, very hard to lead on this issue unless uh, very dramatic things happen on the science side. But the alternative shouldn't be to throw up our hands and say, well, let's not do anything. The, this is a problem. It's a real problem. And it's going to be with us for a long, long time, way more than 50 years. And I think it's also important that we get the process on the right track. I worry that if we start going down a particular track, that, like the one we've inherited, that uh, 10, 20 years from now, we realize that maybe, maybe that's not the place where we want to be. We want to be on a different track. It may be very hard to change after a lot of investments have been put into the process. So for me, I would like uh, to see us consider the alternative of a plan B, that would be a much more effective long-term solution to the climate change problem in Kyoto. Jeff? Uh, until November, Sperling is going to be worrying about November. And after November, he's <laughs> going to be longing for January 20th. <laughs> so uh, from the point, his point of view is just get through this year uh, and uh, let uh, the next government worry about it, hopefully the Gore administration from his point of view. Jeff? Uh, well, I would endorse what Jeff Sachs just said. I think I, I would add that I think public opinion is already moving. I mean, a plurality of Americans um, state that they're concerned about this uh, issue and that they would be prepared to pay something to address it in terms of increased electricity bills, et cetera. Exactly how much? Uh, and how or they should pay and how urgent this issue is is less clear in the American mind. And that could, that could be uh, uh, an, an area that, uh, that needs to be uh, elaborated in terms of sort of the bully pulpit. Um, I think, you know, if we have more severe weather events, uh, snowless ski seasons, uh, you know, dying coral reefs and retreating glaciers, those stories tend to, tend to uh, impact public opinion quite dramatically over time. And, and you see this in, in debate on the Senate floor, Senator Robert Byrd, from West Virginia uh, talks about changes in weather that he's witnessed in his life and believes that we need to take action on climate change. David? Uh, I also think he's got a lot on his plate between now and November. I couldn't imagine uh, making this a major issue. If he wanted to do one thing to help change public opinion, uh, it might be valuable for the United States to come right out and say, we cannot and are not on track to comply with our Kyoto target. The last week, the uh, environment minister in Canada s said that as well. And we ought to, that I think would, would create enough of a shock to start some additional thinking about what, uh, uh, what, what we do. But the probability of him doing that, I think, is about zero. Well, you've heard a nice range of opinions from a, a, about as good a group of experts as you could want. Uh, 
Needless to say, now all you have to do is take your notes, transcribe them, and your assignment is done. But uh, please thank the panel for making that possible for you. Thank you all. That was, that was great.